What skills, what knowledge, what attitudes might we seek to instill in our students to encourage them to develop their own capacity and support those of others? Kevin? Sure, as the unreconstructed academic. Um, I, I, I have the old fashioned belief that education matters. You know, uh, and that training people to read critically and think critically is a really important skill. And I also believe that social change can happen because of a cataclysm, right? Some kind of change that in the course of a year or two changes the direction of a society. Often it's a war. But I think in the longer term, which is what Elise Boulding was really talking about, social change is really generational change. And one hopes that attitudes towards others, prejudices, biases, and so forth, that we might have accepted as a given around the Thanksgiving table when we heard the way our grandparents spoke, just don't make sense to us anymore and make less sense to our children and less sense to their grandchildren. So, I, you know, you're, you're talking to someone who devoted his entire life to education, so I'd like to think that education matters and that critical skills matter and that learning about the world comparatively matters, you know, and, and, and history is a part of that, not just the social sciences. Thinking about what happened when Rome went from being a republic to, a, to, to, to an empire, really matters in thinking about the difference between the American Republic and the American Empire. Those are important skills. But I think other than a cataclysm, real social change, pro-social change, happens generationally. And we have to hope that our children and our grandchildren are just better analysts and more normatively engaged than our grandparents were, and that we are. Thank you very much. Carla. I think there are three fundamental principles we need to drive forward if we want to see an end to conflict. Um, the first is that our attitude has to be to increase the autonomy and independence of situations of fragility and conflict so that they're able to work and act more capably on their own. And I think um, that's also true of development. I mean, one of the things I would actually applaud in the new, US, new USAID administrator is that he has really placed an emphasis on working themselves out of a job, that the goal of development assistance should be to, for uh, aid agencies to move away and for countries to be able to survive and thrive on their own. So I think that needs to be a fundamental precondition for moving things forward. I think the second is um, partnership and collaborative relationships. And um, if we look at the way the, the economic system has evolved to a greater degree of interdependence for mutual benefit and looking for win-win opportunities, I think that that underlying theory of partnership needs to apply more systematically uh, in, in political and foreign policy and in how we resolve conflict and in how we look at the actors uh, involved in the diplomatic defense and development space as well as humanitarian and other spaces. And then I think the third, if we really want to end a lot of these intransigent conflicts around the world, um, and as a total non-academic, um, not reconstructed, unconstructed, practitioner and policymaker, then I think that um, really what we need to do is to change the way peace is built. Because too often the only people that we're involving in trying to resolve conflict are the people carrying weapons. And the only way you're gonna change that equation is by bringing different voices to the table, changing the dialogue, changing the, the terms on which peace agreements are founded and changing the balance of power within the societies that have been affected by conflict for generations. Great, thank you very much, Carla. Gary, same, same question. Skills, yeah, knowledge, you, attitudes. You'd you think having a long time to think about it, I'd have a great answer. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I, to me, you know, what, what skills, what do we need to instill? Uh, I think the sustainable development goals are a good place to start for people who like want to, to kind of leave the world a better place than what they found it. And that's a great blueprint. But I think you need to, to also kind of catalyze curiosity uh, and, and a thirst for social justice. I think when you, when you put uh, those things together, then 
you can start to figure out how do you solve some of the world's most intractable problems. And I think that this concept of, of cross-discipline thinking, you know, taking those, those ideas or concepts that are seemingly unrelated to what you're doing and try to, to leverage them in. I was, I'm just listening to this book on tape by Walter Isaacs and Da Vinci and uh, mm -hmm. is talking about like genius is when you can take those disparate ideas and, and bring them together in a way to get that insight so that you can really change things. And, and to me, I mean, that's why I like to listen to TED Talks. That's why I go to TED, you know, because you go there to like be taken outside of your discipline, mm -hmm. to hear ideas from other disciplines to see how those might intersect. And that's where, you know, this, the crucible of creativity really happens, social entrepreneurship. And for me, it was that I lived that out because I was an engineer. You know, I have three engineering degrees. I don't have any finance degrees. And so I could have been very hunkered down and like, okay, it takes a different kind of pump, a silver bullet filter to solve this crisis. But like going out there and seeing what else is there, it's like, oh, there's this thing called microfinance. And you talk to all the microfinance experts, it's like, yeah, this is great, but it'll never work for water, as I was saying before, because you can't generate an income. So what woman's gonna repay her loan? It's like, well, let's take that force and bend it towards water and sanitation. And my insights in water and sanitation combined with the insights around microfinance, it's like, okay, it can work. Yes, it can't, it can't generate income directly, but it can save huge amounts of expenditures that would have otherwise happen to the water vendors and to doctors for healthcare and so on. And so I think that's, that's what we need to do. And never has there been a better time for people coming out of university to, to seize on this with the support of uh, you know, organizations like the Skoll Foundation on social entrepreneurship, uh, organizations like Omidyar Networks that are there. There's never been a greater concentration of wealth in the history of the world and a willingness on the part of those that hold the wealth to do something socially constructive with that. And you just have to look no further than the giving pledge that uh, mm -hmm. you know, Warren Buffett and, and the Gateses started. That capital is just sitting there waiting for the spark of the ideas from people you know, in this room to say, ah, this is my insight, this is how things can change, and then have the capital to, to do it. And I think that's what's, what's key for people coming out today. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much.